Um, so yeah, Larry really wanted to be here to give this talk about the new ash dispersal model for the USGS, but couldn't make it this week, so I'm just giving it on his behalf. So this is really about a new uh, code that's been developed for forecasting ash hazards from explosive volcanoes, and uh, also it's used as a research tool. And particularly the focus here is on how everybody in this room could potentially use this in your own research. So clearly, you know, there are challenges with having volcanoes nearby in terms of disrupting grounds transportation, uh, respiration problems, clogging air filters, and I think there were some interesting posters on some of these topics um, on how they affect power transformers and, and other aspects of infrastructure. Clearly, there's a major hazard to aircraft, um, including 2008 eruption in Chile. And so the goal, really, of dispersal models is to target how we can best respond and predict what's going to happen during these eruptions. Specifically, where is the ash going to go, and which specific areas um, are going to receive ash? So these are kind of the, the targets for an operational mode of ash dispersal forecasting. So ash 3D, the whole sort of um, structure of the code is to work quickly to develop a forecast of where the ash is going to go given certain source parameters in a given wind field. It also produces a list of the airports uh, that are going to be affected by the ash and for, for how long they're going to be affected. And the other kind of neat thing that people are starting to do for a bunch of different models is develop KMZ files that can be opened up in Google Earth and sort of read by a huge um, variety of different groups. And this is the thing that we'll kind of look at here is the web, the sort of freely available web version of Ash 3D that, that anybody can use for, um, as a research tool. So this is a relatively new code. It's been in operation for about two years. 41 different groups are using it either for, for forecasting operationally or just for, for looking at sort of the dynamics of volcanic plumes, um, including, including these people here. There's documentation in the form of a published paper, but also a user's guide that kind of goes through the basics. And these are available online. And some, some new kind of forthcoming papers that actually use it as a, in a research context. So first of all, we'll kind of go over how to access this, and then we'll get into the physics of the model as well, and then some applications. So to actually access the code, you just sign up. You go to this web page, you enter your information, and request a username. There's the web page. You create a new job. And these are the really basic, this is a kind of stripped down version of the code where you can enter just these very basic input parameters and look at where a volcanic uh, ash cloud would go anytime from 1948 to present. So you know you, you enter your, your information for what you want to call the run, but the key things are you know which volcano are we talking about, the start time, and the reason that there's a, a limited time period that you can do um, kind of back forecasting or um, something into the future is that 1948 is when the wind fields were readily available. You put in how long you want to run your simulation and how long the eruption is going to last. And the plume height. The erupted volume is, is also one of the things you need to put in there as a, as a dense rock, so bubble free. But something I think is really interesting about this is that you'll notice you put in the dense rock equivalent of magma effectively, but the model only erupts 5% of that into the atmosphere. And this is something that's been picked up sort of a, a new idea because volcanic ash dispersal or volcanic ash advisory centers are finding more and more that the mapped mass of an eruption is much, much greater than the mass of material that's actually transported distally. And so this is a sort of fudge factor to try and uh, account for the really um, complex proximal processes like aggregation and you know, complex dynamics that make a lot of that material sediment out really early. So you're only going to actually erupt 5% into the distal atmosphere. 
Jobs take only five to 15 minutes. And this is, again, this is the stripped down version of the code, so it doesn't have some of the fancy processes, but they're, they're it's designed to run quickly, so that if there was an emergency and you needed to look at, you know, really quickly, where's the ash gonna go, which airports are gonna be affected, um, it can be pretty quick. So you get a kind of GIF or different graphic formats of the output. KMZ files are one of those. And your list of your airports that are affected by the ash, when, that, when the ash cloud is gonna arrive and how long it's gonna be um, hanging over the airport. There's some other files that you can look at that have additional data included in them. And so in terms of how this thing actually works, this is a, an Eulerian finite volume model, which I'm sure Marcus will go over some of these aspects in the general kind of ash dispersal modeling framework. But this is one, one version of, of um, ash dispersal modeling. And it's different from, this doesn't actually resolve the dynamics of the volcanic column. So the kind of how high the eruption column is gonna go and the vertical distribution of mass, those, those are all input parameters. So you're starting from a sort of estimated starting point. But where this kind of model really comes into play and is really powerful is that it has a complex three-dimensional wind field. So you're really looking at the, the more distal transport of a volcanic plume. So the way that this particular code works is it divides the, the atmosphere into the, a 3D grid. And the eruption is placed into a series of source nodes over one of the grids, one of the cells. And I mentioned before that it doesn't resolve the, the rise height of the volcanic plume. And so to, to give it a distribution of mass over the volcano, you initialize it with a sort of, this is called a Suzuki distribution, which just assumes that more of the mass is concentrated at the top of the plume, like the umbrella, and you can adjust the parameters to make that more of a, vert a vertically, like kind of homogeneous column of ash, or something that's really much more umbrella-like. Then ASH3D calculates the, the flux of the volcanic particles through those cell walls, and as Leah was alluding to before, it's advected downwind, primarily by the wind, it settles gravitationally, and this diffusion coefficient, which is our sort of fudge factor to account for the complex, you know, sort of turbulent dynamics of the plume that allows the plume to sort of spread out as it's, as it's traveling along. As far as the wind field that is used to initialize the model, um, I think Marcus was mentioning this earlier in the meeting, once, once the volcanic ash cloud moves a certain distance away from the vent, it primarily becomes a meteorological phenomenon. And so the, the global winds or the, the winds involved in the model become really important. And so this model interpolates from a global wind field at 2.5 uh, degrees resolution provided by NOAA NCAR reanalysis, twice daily updates. And that global wind field on the coarser grid is interpolated linearly onto the finer mesh of your prescribed simulation area. So, so you can see here that this is a huge mesh. This allows you to do volcanic ash dispersal over kind of continental scales. Um, it can also sort of do global, but of course, you're usually limited by the resolution of your winds and how accurate your winds really are. So the way that um, the model sort of starts itself up is that it does a really quick little mini run at the beginning in a coarse node right, right over the volcano. 10 second quick simulation and then has a, sees how far the ash cloud is supposed to go in that wind field and then adjusts the grid to sort of capture just the area that you need over the prescribed time that you've told it to run that simulation. And then it finally does the full run in that better described mesh. So some of the areas that are being used to explore research questions are include this aggregation problem that we were talking about yesterday 
And this is something that's very, very poorly described in volcanic dispersal models. There's only one in existence that tries to capture the actual physics of aggregation in a dispersal model. So this is something that we're actively working on, trying to use field data from eruptions to better inform the way that we parameterize this process in distal ash dispersal models. Mount St. Helens is a classic example to do that on. Another area of research is using sort of developing probabilistic estimation of source parameters from a sort of Bayesian technique of informing your forecast based on incoming information from satellite data. So there's a recent paper on this and there's forthcoming work. This is kind of a, an emerging topic in ash dispersal problems. How can you best use the satellite information that's coming in in real time to inform your ongoing simulation? And then the effects of umbrella cloud growth, because I mentioned before that the ash plume is primarily advected by the wind in most dispersal models. But if you actually account for the spreading of the umbrella, this can fundamentally change, actually, the dynamics of your plume if you're talking about a big eruption. So smaller eruptions tend to just be passively advected by the wind. They're kind of bent over, and they, they're primarily a, f a meteorological phenomenon. But if you have a very big eruption, like what we've recently simulated for a sort of super eruption from Yellowstone in the modern day, um, the spreading of that umbrella can go against the wind field and sort of dominate the dynamics of the plume. So this is something that's not yet available on the online version of ASH3D, but it, it could potentially become available. So this, was, this is just an interesting comparison between a Yellowstone super eruption in, in modern day winds without an umbrella cloud, and the same eruption with. So you can see that you have an almost radially symmetric uh, dispersal of ash products if you account for that really powerfully spreading umbrella. So we can see that this, this is a huge player in very large eruptions. And that's really it. So this is a widely used tool in operational decision making. It can also be a research tool for helping us understand ash transport and look at some interesting problems both on the research level and in real time probabilistic sort of accounting for incoming information. And anybody who's interested in creating a user account can toy with this and have a look at how ash produced from a volcano anytime between now and 1948 uh, where the ash would, is likely to be dispersed. Thank you.
the eruption, so how big is it? That's a necessarily easy question to answer. And the wind field. So if this eruption happened before 1948, the wind fields aren't automatically available online, but you can get them. You can get raw winds. So if we play around and basically say, well, we have a relatively small eruption and we can give it different times to see, you know, are there are there potential conditions that would get the ash across? Yeah, absolutely. And how how thick or thin would those layers be and where would they go? Because this this provides quantitative data. You have both the ash concentrations in the atmosphere and the deposit on the ground. So if you can play around the grain size parameters as well and look at, you know, what's the grain size of your material and how big would the eruption have to be to make that show up in your computer background? So similarly, could you use it in an inverse way to, like, if you have the distribution of a particular type of could you reconstruct the wind field when that type of wind This This is not designed for the inverse problem, but TEFRA 2 is really a powerful tool for that, which we're, we'll talk about tomorrow in the workshop. So this is more of a forward tool. Yes, you can do that. You can reconstruct into the inverse problem with ash but it's not specifically set up for that. Um, so you, you can do it, but you have to kind of do a lot of the offline calculations. Um, the, so TEFRA 2 and ash are, are quite different in that ash has a really complex three-dimensional wind field, whereas TEFRA 2 and, and these various versions of Tefra are really suited for the inverse problem for reconstructing the dynamics from your deposit. So that's, I guess, that's the cheesy Yeah, we have a number of geologists at ABO who are interested in this reverse modeling. So Alexa's right, you have to contact Tom Schwager and have him be involved with it because you, know, you can do all that kind of stuff. But it's not set up to do this online. Um, but we're constantly asking him to do it for us. So trying to reconstruct these up ice amounts data or just thickness data at any given point. So we're working on that. Mm -hmm. so that's a good point actually. For problems that people are interested in, you know, those can be built in. There are Hans Schweiger is an awesome sort of designer for this model. And so if there are really interesting research questions, he can build that in. Um, but the interest has to be there. This one uh, question. I remember being shown by a physicist in Montreal in the meteorological office uh, modeling that they had been doing on one of the recent eruptions across North America. I forgot the actual one. But in the ultra distance zone, the, you can't, it seems almost impossible to predict the fallout and uh, where this step is going to be deposited because it's interacting with a number of different air masses. And you see the Ash cloud doubling back on itself and then going in another direction. It, it, it seems almost like a chance that you would get this very fine grain fallout uh, being deposited in the particular spot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there are still so many questions that really need to be better defined to fine tune these models. And so, but that's, that's why there's a research mode and then the operational mode. Operations want to know, based on what we have now, what can we produce? But yeah, all of these subgrid meteorological effects and the effects of aggregation, which have a huge impact on the ultra distal fallout, are very, very poor to constrain. One more question? Yeah, I, I think the question has been answered actually, but uh, I know that like TEFRA 2 is really poor at actually estimating grain size at ultra distal levels. So in Europe, when we find TEFRAs in Britain, or, or in fact, further, even in southern Eastern Europe, the models always really underestimate the size of the tephra that you find. So you might well find 100 micron size shards in Eastern Europe, which the, 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 the models are really poor at actually saying how they actually got there. I just wonder whether or not, does it, uh, does it estimate the size of the particles? Does it estimate the size of particles which go? It, it can do that. I think that the, the version that you find online doesn't automatically have a really complex grain size distribution, but the research mode of the model can definitely do that. You can play around with different grain size distributions and look at which sizes will land where. You can absolutely do that. Can I just make a comment? That models like Tefra 2, um, it's not just that they're poor at grain sizes farther away, they are not meant to be used farther than about 100 kilometers from a volcano. It would be an invalid application to use the models that far. They were not designed for that. Whereas models like this that use the fully 3D wind fields are the only ways you can say anything about the distal deposit. Uh, that's important. Yeah.
yeah, that is a good point. And same with the volcanic eruption of Kala models. You really, as soon as you get into this complex, really distal wind field, um, those models tend to break down. So this is, I mean, you know, there are limitations and, and really simplified physics in a lot of the ways that these models treat volcanic plumes. But the fact that they can have a continental scale, three-dimensional wind field is the overwhelming strength. 